Hello, I'm John Fund with National Review Magazine and FoxNews.com. Well, what a year it has been for all of us. The pandemic is slowly receding. We still have to exercise great caution, but it's not too early to look back and try to figure out what lessons we can learn from that and also what warning signals there are for the future. Uh, we were told a year ago in March that the lockdowns and the other restrictions on our liberties were going to be of a very temporary duration. 15 days to crunch the curve. Well, I have to say, for many countries which haven't really come out of lockdown, it feels more like 15 months to crunch society. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. It is very important that once we recover from this pandemic, we don't transition into what I call a plandemic, which means we no longer have the freedoms, the entrepreneurial innovation, uh, the ability to create new and interesting things in our societies because regulation, restrictions, and a general increase in government spending and taxation will make all of that much more difficult. I'm not saying we go back to normal, but the new normal has to be something that preserves the essence of our free societies. Uh, the civil liberties, the entrepreneurship, uh, the dynamics of the free market, and the free trade and flow of goods that have brought us so much prosperity. There is a danger, though, that a different model will take hold. Now, the U.S. and other governments have spent lavishly to boost the economy during the pandemic, and many people have grown to like this idea. Like it so much, in fact, that history suggests that high levels of public expenditure will continue to be a norm for a long time to come. People come to benefit from it and then to expect it. That makes it harder to go back to a time of restraint and lower spending. Now let's look at the New Deal, a period of very intense public expenditure during the Great Depression that gave way to, of course, the even greater spending and even greater restrictions on liberties of World War II. U.S. outlays as a share of GDP went from 3% to 9% by the end of 1933, and then to nearly 10% by the end of the 1930s. The World War came in, everything exploded, and expenditure was 41% by 1944. It wasn't just that the government spent on infrastructure or welfare of the military. It was that the government imposed more regulation and taxes as well. The state grew bigger in nearly every possible way. And of course, it never permanently came back down. Just after 1945, the government stopped spending on fighting the war. So a sharp dip ensued but then, of course, spending began to climb again very quickly, as welfare state spending took the place of the military spending. By the time Ronald Reagan became president in the 1980s, net outlays were still about 20% of GDP in the U.S. Reagan just slowed the growth of big government, and his successors began to increase it gradually. So they were running deficits of around 4% or 5% a year. The largest peacetime spike until the pandemic came just after the 2008 recession, when federal net outlays in the U.S. touched 24%. As of now, after COVID-19, the figure has hit 36%, assuming that all the allocated money that's been authorized by Congress is spent. And President Joe Biden's proposed $4 trillion stimulus, did you ever think that number would just trip off our tongue, has not yet been factored in. That's a pretty substantial number. The GDP in 2019 was $21 trillion. So Biden's spending is close to 20% of our entire nation's gross national product on its own. Indeed, the government grew on the back of emergencies such as the Great Depression and the World Wars. 
the economist Robert Higgs has found in his famous book, Crisis and Leviathan. What Higgs said is that if we analyze the results of these emergencies, he quote, said, chief among them, the enduring legacies of emergency governmental expenditures has been ideological change. In particular, a profound transformation of the typical person's beliefs about the scope and size of government. I fear that we may be living through that again. It isn't just the public that comes to prize such expenditures. The political environment, the political opposition to these growth and government reduces to Pub Republican governments through the second half of the 20th century didn't always aim to be leaner. In no presidency, Republican or Democratic in the United States, since that of Dwight D. Eisenhower, has the U.S. seen a decline in federal outlays as a percentage of the GDP. And Eisenhower himself, in the midst of expanding Social Security, building highways and constructing low-income housing, well, all of this we call infrastructure today, only brought spending down from 20.4% to 18.4%. The pandemic represents another crisis of the kind that Robert Higgs discussed in his book. So if his observation is any guide, the size of the state and its expenditure will not shrink in a hurry. It's easy for people to start thinking, yeah, I survived the pandemic only because of this money. It will open the door for more spending. That's what we have to guard against. Yes, there are lessons to be learned from the pandemic in public health and in the ability that we have to react to these emergencies, but we cannot forget the ultimate emergency is if the fundamental nature of the free market, the fundamental nature of our economy, and the fundamental nature of our civil liberties are negatively affected by how we react to this pandemic going forward. I believe in a free society, we have to have a robust debate about all of these questions. So far, we haven't had that, possibly for understandable reasons. But now is the time to begin that debate. And that is why the Hayek Institute and the Austrian Economic Center are so important in starting this discussion. I am pleased to be a part of this. I am always happy to speak on behalf of the Hayek Institute, which I believe represents the best and finest of classical liberal values. And with that, I welcome you to join and participate in this discussion with myself, the other speakers, and of course the staff of the Hayek Institute. Thank you very much.